start in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. How many of, have, of you have ever looked back on your life and seen times where uh, maybe at the time you didn't realize it, but later on you, you found out that God intervened, and man, you're glad God intervened. And so uh, today the title of my message is, But God, But God. And uh, uh, there was a few years back at our church where I was invited to uh, combine churches with another church in town. I wasn't really certain if I should do it or not, but we started going uh, through talks. And at that time, I just so happened uh, to have a preacher coming through. And uh, the gentleman that wanted uh, me to combine churches with him, he came to our church service. Uh, and it was just a short three-day meeting. And he knew this preacher, and this preacher knew him. And the preacher that I had in called me aside and said, Brother, this is one uh, thing you don't want to do. You don't want to get involved with this guy. This guy had something that he had done in New York and had left and come all the way across the country to start out here. And had I gotten involved, it could have, it could have ended badly. I look back on it and I say, but God, <laughs> thank you, Lord, for intervening. And I'm glad the Lord intervenes. And we'd be nothing if he didn't intervene. <laughs> and so... Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, For ye, well, let me start in verse 25. It says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So now he's going to give you an example. <laughs> For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God. See that there? But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. <laughs> and uh, you know, some guys are naturally gifted. Some guys are naturally smart. Some guys are naturally talented. The rest of us are not. <laughs> And I'm really glad that God doesn't always call a guy to do something simply because he's got the qualifications. The Lord will put a guy in a spot to do something for him that you would have never thought he could have done it. You know, over the years in, my, in the ministry, I've been uh, asked, hey, why don't we have somebody do this or why don't we have somebody do that? And uh, I've tried to ask different people, hey, can you do this or can you do that? And uh, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But I find this, the most important thing is uh, not necessarily if the guy is qualified or has the talents or has the skills. What matters is, is God going to get in on it? How many of you remember uh, Moses in the Bible, right? You remember him? I hope you remember him. <laughs> and Moses uh, one day had his father-in-law come and saw what he was doing. And Moses would sit there and the people would come to him and and, 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 and he would uh, answer their questions all day long and hear their problems. And his father-in-law, stepping over to the side, saw it and said, Now, Mo, what you're doing isn't the best way to go about this. He said, What you need to do is you need to find a bunch of guys. You need to put them in positions and let them do that. And you just take the hard stuff. Yeah. And so he does that. He does exactly what his father-in-law tells him to do. But guess what? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work out because he's back in the same situation again. Right. And he says, Lord, this is too heavy for him. Yeah. Then you know what the Lord told him? He said, you will get some men, and this time, I'm going to put my spirit on them. Oh. That's what we need nowadays. Woo! We don't need guys who've got the qualifications or guys who have all this talent. We need guys who've got God's hand on them. Amen. That's what we need. Amen. But God, why? So that way you can't get any of the glory. That's why. Now notice what it says in verse, uh, verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren. It's almost as if to say, look at your own calling, reflect on it. Because why in the world should you even be here doing something for the Lord? Uh, it's not because you're smart, talented, beautiful, and maybe you do have some of those things. But if anything gets done, it's because God got in on it. God got in on it. Yep. 
There are very few of us that are in a class that are found in verse 26. Wise men after the flesh, mighty, noble. There's very few of us that are like that. Uh, you know, one time there was a, a fellow by the name of Naaman the Syrian. He had leprosy. Yeah. And the little girl said, uh, hey, you know, you ought to you ought to send over there to the land. There's a prophet over there. He could take care of you. And uh, so what do they do? <laughs> Instead of going to the prophet, who do they go to? You guys remember? Went to the king. Wrote a letter to the king. I mean, if the prophet can do it, imagine what the king could do. <laughs> oh, no, you got it wrong. <laughs> you see, the Lord was behind the prophet. And uh, and that's what we need. We need the Lord behind us. We need that. You know, uh, I may not be the most talented. I may not have the, the best ability to preach. And I know I don't have the best ability to pastor. I know there's guys that can do the job much better and have the talent. But bless God, Brother Gorski, I'm going to shoot. Come on. <laughs> amen. Amen. <laughs> Now, uh, hey amen, I'll pull that thing back and shoot. <laughs> you know, one time there was a fellow in the Bible named Gideon. Take your Bible and go over to Judges 6. Judges, hold your place in Corinthians. We'll come back there. Judges 6. Judges 6. Now, in Judges 6, notice verse 15. Now, this is... Uh, Gideon and the angel of the Lord having a conversation in verse 15, it says, and he said unto him, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Now watch, watch how he looks at himself. Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. I ain't got nothing. I'm just, I'm the least. Now that wasn't the key to the success. The key to the success was that the Lord was going to be behind him. Notice in chapter seven and verse tw in verse two. Notice that the Lord is dwindling the numbers down. Why is he dwindling them down? Verse 2. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me and say, Mine hand has saved me. Right. You know, sometimes uh, you just got to realize if anything happens, it's the Lord doing it. Yeah. Uh, that's how it's going to get done. You know, I don't use uh, spiritual tests. You ever seen the spiritual gifts test? I don't, I don't necessarily use those. And I don't know if you use, if you use them, that's your business. I don't use those. And uh, here's what I found, is I found that the person that I think has the qualities to do the job is not necessarily the one who should be doing it. And I found, I found that there's been guys who I thought, man, this guy would be great for it. I mean, he's got the personality. He's got the connections. He's got the skill and the ability. But no, he's not the guy. And then all of a sudden, somebody over here who you never, you would have never even looked twice at him. But the Lord uses them. Ain't that a blessing? That's a blessing. That's a blessing because that means you and I can get in on it. The problem is, is when you start getting like Saul and you're no longer little in your own sight. That's the problem. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't prepare yourself. You should. Uh, I'm not saying that you, uh, but what I'm saying is you should not rely on your natural abilities, your talents, your status, your connections, or even on your preparation. If anything gets done, realize that, realize that it's God that did it and bless him for it and give him the glory. Now take your Bible, go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2. So the first thing I want to say is God chooses the foolish to confound the wise. The second thing is God reveals. Notice what he reveals. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2. Did I say 2 Corinthians? Okay, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. It says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And uh, our, our preacher was talking just a moment ago about getting up to the third heaven. And man, I'm ready to go. <laughs> It sure could you imagine if, if we if you know right about the time Brother Kogel gets done he starts preaching you know and he gets ready the invitation psh, up there we go boy that'd be a blessing man <laughs> we don't even have to wait that long Lord we can go right now <laughs> now you're gonna get up there could you I mean I mean all eternity you're just walking around and seeing what the Lord has prepared Amen. now notice what it says in verse 10 so after the things that you that I have not seen or you heard and had to enter into the heart of man. But it says in verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by a spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And I want to say that the Lord reveals, the second thing is the Lord reveals the unknown prepared things. 
It says, but God hath revealed them. You know, uh, things, uh, there are things that through your natural intelligence you'll never know. Just because you're naturally smart, you'll never figure them out. God's got to show them to you. God's got to show it to you. You know, that's why you've got to spend time in a book. But thank God I've got my own personal instructor. I do. I have my personal instructor, right? It's the Holy Spirit of God. He's going to teach me. I've got the Holy Spirit. And if you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit too. Uh, and what you got to do is you got to get down your knees. You got to pray over some of this stuff. Say, Lord, I don't understand it. I mean, I really appreciate the, the ministry the Lord gave you, brother. I watch Brother Kim's stuff and I get a blessing from it. I learn from it. I'll tell you what, though, but he could teach us. And just like Dr. Ruckman st- uh, stood there and taught us. And you can get taught till you're blue in the face. But it's the Lord that grants you the understanding. That's what it is. And you got to be praying about it. Let me give you an example. Look at Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. But God, Luke 18, I'll tell you what, sometimes I, uh, I feel sorry for my people that, uh, my, my church members, I do because they got to listen to me <laughs> and, uh, and I'll, I, I pray, Lord, I, I need to, I need to know this. I want to understand it. Yeah. This is an amazing book folks. Yes. And the more I read through it, the more I, I realize just how amazing this book is. Yeah. Luke 18, I was coming along my Bible reading one day. And I saw this in verse 31. It says, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So now he's, Jesus Christ is talking to his disciples and is explaining to them things that they had read about in the prophets. Are you following me so far? All right, so he's explaining them these things. Now, this is not a trick question, but what is verse 32 and verse 30, 33? For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death and, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Not a trick question. That's talking about Calvary, right? The death and resurrection of Christ. You know that, don't you? Uh, so anyway, doesn't know that. All right, that's what it is. But watch their reaction. Verse 34. But they, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Now, here you have the greatest Bible teacher in the entire... You have the Word Himself explaining the Word, and they don't get it. (laughs) Ain't that something? (laughs) Now, it's hid from them. They don't get it. The understanding is not open. It's hid from them. Now, let's go a little further. Take your Bible and look at Luke 24. Now, every time I read that passage of Scripture, I always... I always think to myself, if the disciples who are standing there and Jesus is explaining the death, down resurrection and he's right there in front of them, then how is it that in the Old Testament they look forward to the cross and the New Testament they look back to the cross if the disciples had no idea what he's talking about? I don't understand that. All right, Luke 24, notice verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. These are the things he'd already told him before. We saw that before. Now watch the reaction this time. Watch what happens. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. When you get down on your knees, you ought to say, Lord, open my understanding. I want to understand that book. That's an amazing book, folks. I'll tell you what, the more I begin to understand it, the more the Lord begins to open my eyes up to stuff. Man, it gets, it's with fear and trembling. (laughs) You stand up and preach and you're giving them the book. This is an amazing book to be delivered. And by the way, I just want to say, I really appreciate the opportunity to preach to you guys. I love you guys and I thank you for this opportunity. Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Watch who does the revealing. Ephesians 3 and verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his apostles and prophets. How? By the Spirit. So if you're going to understand anything in that book, but God. He's the one that's got to reveal it to you. And there are things in that book that you can see that is, that is future, that are things prepared for us. And you know what amazes me? How many Christians don't know anything about heaven? If you were to ask the average Christian, describe heaven to me. They couldn't describe it to you. But they could tell you everything about their favorite baseball player, their favorite basketball player. 
Look, if you were going to go on a trip, I bet you would do some planning. I bet you would look ahead. If you were going to buy a house, I bet you would figure out what's going to happen when you got there. You'd want to go and inspect the house. Is there anything wrong with the foundation? You don't want to get into a house and all of a sudden find out the foundation is bad. Well, I got a house that's got 12 foundations. How come it is that no Christians get in that book to find out where their eternal home is? Find out something about it, man. The Lord will reveal it to you. He'll show it to you. Look at Psalm 25. Psalm 25. I like to read my Bible with a pen in hand. You say, why do you read your Bible with a pen in hand? Because I'm expecting the Lord to show me something. (laughs) Psalm 25. Verse 4. Here's something you could pray. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. I grew up in a Christian home. And I thank the Lord for it. One of you gave a testimony up there. and, And I love what you said. You said, you know, it's nice to hear all the stories that these other guys say. I like learning about it that way. I don't want to have to actually go through it myself. And what he was talking about is a guy who got saved uh, later in life and went through all this sin. And and, and, and he's, I'd much rather, I'm so glad God saved me at a young age. I'm glad the Lord did that. And I'm not perfect. (laughs) I'm a sinner just like you. I thank the Lord that, that he did that. But you know what I found out? I found sometimes... I found growing up in a you know, Christian home, sometimes you tend to ride your mom and dad's coattails spiritually. You know what I'm talking about, right? You ride the spiritual coattails of them, or you ride the spiritual coattails of your, of your Sunday school teacher. And there's nothing wrong with borrowing some of their religion. In other words, there's nothing wrong with see, you know, getting excited when you get around them. That's why we get here in church, and we encourage each other. But there's got to come a time when you... Get along with God yourself. And you say, God, teach me thy ways. That's what you need. You need it. Because one day, mom and dad aren't always going to be there. Sunday school teacher always going to be there. The pastor's not always going to be there. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not really look. I, I hope that, that getting thrown in jail thing doesn't happen really soon. I hope it doesn't happen soon. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a wuss. <laughs> I don't like pain or none of that stuff. All right, verse 5. He says, lead me in thy truth and teach me. There you go. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Sometime when you uh, fellas are at work or even when you're driving in your car, you ought to just start thinking about Scripture. Getting ready to go home, getting ready to go to sleep at night, start mulling over a, a verse of Scripture in your mind and fall asleep to it. Start, start thinking about those kind of things. And say, Lord, teach me. The psalmist said, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. All right, look at 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. And if I recollect, preacher, you want me to finish at the bottom of the hour, right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter? All right. And as Pastor Stevenson was long preaching until midnight. (laughs) Well, thankfully, none of you are sitting in the window. All right. 1 Corinthians 3. Now, verse 6, the next thing is the Lord gives. And the thing that he gives here in this text, he gives the increase of our labor. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, he says, but I have, I says, I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. I'm thankful for that. So then neither is he that planteth anything, (laughs) neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man, this is important, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together, watch this, with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. And if you keep reading, he goes into the judgment seat of Christ. Now, God gives the, la- gives the increase of our labor, but God gives the increase of our labor. Uh, God gives the increase to the labor that you put in, so don't be a lazy Christian. A lot of Christians are lazy. They would, uh, I, I, uh, we go out and we'll knock on doors in our area and, or run into other Christians. And I find that sometimes I hear this often. I hear this often. Our church does this. Our church does that. Now, that's great. I'm glad that your church does that. The question is, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you involved? Get in. Do something. 
And uh, you'll find that God gives the increase. Now, this is a, uh, this is a strange field that we labor in. Really strange. Uh, there, uh, I'll give you an example. Last uh, Saturday, we went out street preaching. And, uh, and, and then we had prayer meeting uh, at night, our monthly uh, prayer meeting there. And we all got down. We did this. And uh, the next day, we had, we had uh, somebody come to church from a uh, retirement home right next door to our, our church. We didn't go over there on Saturday, but that's where the fruit came from. And then somebody else came to church from Pastor Gene Ha's YouTube videos. I, 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 you say, see, this is a strange field we labor in. Yeah. I'm laboring over here. Wow, that's good. And the fruit comes in from over here. Yeah. And so you run over here and you labor over here. And the fruit comes in from over there. Yeah. You know why? It's God giving the increase. That's why. You're just supposed to be working. Also, remember this. You're entering into other men's labors, and they're entering into yours. You know why? Because it's the master that directs where the work is to take place. Remember that. You know, uh, I remember when I was uh, growing up, there was a big emphasis that was put on being the next Philadelphia age preacher and building a big work. There was a lot of emphasis put on that. And, uh, of course, you know, I have a small work. Most Bible believers are pretty much a small work. And I want to tell you, though, that uh, I know a lot of interesting stories happened from the Philadelphia church age. But there was a lot of stuff going on by just average, everyday, ordinary Christians just going all over the place and witnessing. I was reading uh, that book from Jerusalem to Arian Jaya. And it said some of the early Christians... The way that uh, the gospel, the missionary work was spread was just by average, everyday, ordinary Christians that you'll never know their name. Wow. They're just getting the work done. Yeah. Just getting it done. We like to sing the song, Little is Much When God is in it. Yeah. Now notice it says this. It says, uh, every man will receive according to his own labor, his own labor. So what are you putting in? But remember this. Remember this. When you get out there and you work, uh, pray this. Like Psalm 119, 126 says, it is time for thee, Lord, to work. And when the work gets done, it's because the Lord's working through you. Now, notice here, notice here that, the, that, uh, that Paul increases his skill level, quote unquote. Notice in verse 10, he says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. So you've got your, uh, your master builder. That's like, that's like the top tier. You come in as an apprentice, and then you become a journeyman, and then you become a master. And notice he, he, he increases his, uh, his skill level, uh, so to speak. But notice why he's able to do it. It's only because of the grace of God. He says in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and other builder thereon. So the idea is, is God gives you the grace and because he's given you the grace, then you're able to increase and do something for him. You know, this brings out a whole new, uh, whole new mindset of, of uh, where he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. And if we're going to get anything done, it's because of the grace of God. Now, this thought is a little bit too deep for me. Maybe some of you can uh, develop a sermon and send it to me. But, you know, maybe we should be praying for more grace and saying, Lord, build me up in your grace. And uh, that's what we need. I want to tell you, unless God is in it, it won't work. The Bible says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. We need God in it. Look, this is a jubilee. We're getting here. We're resetting. We're getting ready to start out the new year. Man, it's good fellowship. You know what we need, though? Going to 2020, we need God to be in on it. We need God in our church up in San Jose. God in our church down in San Diego. God in our church here. God in our church in Lancaster. That's what we need. We need God in on it. God, give us grace. And I want to say this, this is, uh, I just saw this in my Bible reading the other day. Go over to uh, Judges 18, Judges 18. You know, we live, uh, you hear a lot about things being results oriented. And if you get certain results, then, you mu- then God must be in it because you've got these specific results. You know what I'm talking about? You have these goals, you know, goal oriented, growth oriented, whatever it is, some type of orient, orient. And, uh, and, and if, you have, if you reach your goal, then that must mean that, that the Lord was in it. Uh, in Judges 18, Judges 18, we've got the Danites. 
The Danites, they find a place in verse 7. It says, Then the five men departed and came to Laish. Now, I trust you know this story. This is where the Danites, they're, they're trying to find, a, they're, they're relocating. And they head up to the northern part of Israel, and they find this spot, and they like it. They like what they see because it's an easy target. And so here's what they found. Verse 7, it says, The five men, these are five uh, scouts, I guess you could say, head scouts from the Danites. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people that, they were, uh, that were therein, how they dwelt careless. After the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure. And there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. And they were very far from the Zidonians, had no business with any man. So here they were, they, were, they had, didn't have a care in the world, they weren't vigilant, they weren't looking out for anything. And uh, like you said, that, uh, that uh, fellow that took down that shooter, he was being vigilant. Uh, in, in here, these people, they had no accountability. Nobody was there to put them to shame in anything. Uh, and they had isolated themselves. Really easy target uh, to get to. And the Danites saw this. Now, when they saw this, here was what their response was. Verse 10. It says, when ye go, ye shall come unto a people secure. They're describing the land they're going to go find. And to a large land, for God hath given it into your hands. A place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. So because it's easy, because it's this wonderful target, because it's going to have a posh life, they say, for God hath given it into your hands. But if you know your Bible, you know they got out of the will of God through this move. Look over at, uh, at uh, verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day, all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. Now, they didn't get all their land. They didn't get all this, the, the, the inheritance. So they went looking for something, and they found something easy. When they found something easy, they say, oh, God must be in it because it's easy and it's posh. It's everything I want. Yeah. Why didn't they get it? Wow. Why? Go back to Judges chapter 1. Judges 1. Judges 1 and verse 34. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. So the problem was, the Amorites were a little too challenging for the Danites at the moment, and they pushed them up. So all their inheritance hadn't fallen to them yet. But to go down and attack the Amorites, that's the difficult part. So they end up going for the easy one. And they found the easy one over here where everything is wonderful. And it's posh. And then they attribute it to God giving it to them. How many times has somebody told you everything is wonderful, God must be in it? Or not. Yeah. I wonder how many things people have attributed to, oh, God must have done it when he didn't. Yeah. I mean, isn't it true that Eve said, I have gotten a man from the yeah. Lord? Yeah. Yeah. When talking about Cain? Yeah. Uh -huh. right. Isn't it true that old Rebecca manipulated the will of God by saying, hey, Jacob, take and put these goat skin on. I never saw her son again. And then Rachel, in a contest with her sister, saw that she was losing the game. And so she interjected by giving her handmaid to her husband. And out came Dan. Now I want to tell you something, my, uh, my friends. Look, sometimes being smack dab in the will of God is not always the easiest thing. But if God is in it, it's all right. Amen. Pray for our preachers. Pray for our Christians. Pray for each other that when it gets tough, you don't quit. Man, I tell you what, it sure is a disheartening to watch people through the years quit. It really is. Back to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 6. Thank you.
thank you, put my name on it. <laughs> First Corinthians six, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. So the next thing is, but God destroys the belly and the meat in the belly. Now, notice what our text says after the period found in the middle of verse 13. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, I want to say this. The Lord destroys uh, the belly and the meat that's in the belly. And the reason he's, he does it is because it's his property anyway. You realize your body is property of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Stamped across me is owned by Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's like you put my name on a water bottle. <laughs> I got the Lord's name on me. <laughs> I'm his and he is mine. <laughs> now, that being said, you should put enough emphasis on taking care of your body. Enough emphasis that will allow you to do what God has called you to do. Uh, we learned this, right? We learned a little thing called temperance. You shouldn't overeat. You shouldn't undereat. You shouldn't oversleep. You shouldn't undersleep. We learned these things. And uh, I want to tell you this. Uh, if through neglecting of the body, if that's the reason, if through the ne neglecting of the body you cut your time short, you have to give an account for that because you and I were told to be temperate in all things. Yeah. Now, the reason why I say is I'm not talking about sickness and stuff. That's going to happen. We're in a sinful world. That kind of thing is going to happen. But if all I'm doing is eating Big Macs every single day, all day long, I'm going to cut my time short yeah. unnecessarily. Yeah. Right? So, look, my body is the Lord's. So how about standing before the Lord and say, look, look it, said, it said that the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. That's what it said. How come most Americans nowadays, that's all that's on their mind. They can't think about anything else. Sometimes you just need to stand before the Lord. I mean, why for talking about this on the way up? What if you just prayed this? Lord, how can I use my body for you? Lord, here's my body. It's yours. Wow. Yeah. Now, the world looks at that as insane. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. You know, I mean, you ever seen those sacrifices they do in the Old Testament? Right? Mar oh, you haven't, you haven't seen them, but you've read about them. <laughs> <laughs> You're old enough to see them, man. <laughs> but you know about them, right? You read about them? Yeah. Well, we did in Korea. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. If I got saved from the army, we put the pig head off in the, the tank. Really? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow, amen. <laughs> I'm amazed. That's, that's all. okay, amen. <laughs> now you take that sacrifice. Here's that Jew going down there, right? Or a Korean and a cutting off a pig step on a tank. <laughs> now, now, you, now you take that thing, and could you imagine there's those Jews, they're cutting it up and they're laying all that stuff on the altar, and somebody walks by and they say, wow, that's a really good sheep. Uh, as a matter of fact, that sheep has no blemish on it. What a waste. Why would you waste something like that? But you know what they were doing? They were sacrificing it to the Lord. A missionary, and I'm sure you've heard this before, a missionary one day was uh, watching, and there was a, uh, a, a husband and wife standing. This is one of the countries where they throw the children into the river. And when the, 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 they took a child, they had two children, one child who had deformities, the other child who was a good child. You've heard this story before? And, and they took the child who was fine and threw that child in the river. And the missionary asked him, why did you do that? And they said, well, I don't know what you give to your God, but we give our God our best. Right. Now, the problem is, is, is if you're not careful, you take on the mindset of the world that, it's a, that a sacrifice is a waste. But the Bible says we're to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord. And that's reasonable. That's reasonable, my friend. Now, I, I was listening to Dr. Ruckman one day and he made this comment about uh, bodily exercise and uh, spirit. The exercise of the spirit and exercise of the soul because man has three parts. And he talked about bot we need bodily exercise because uh, we live in a day and age where, I mean, technically we live in kind of a soft day and age. I mean, did anybody have to ride a horse to get here? I have to ask now. I mean, we got, we got all sorts of, anybody ride a horse? Nobody? Okay. All right. So, so, 
So, I mean, we, we're, we're pretty soft. We drove a car. We have a rental car that, that, that I set the cruise control on it. And this thing, this thing senses when another car is in front of it and slows itself down. And then, and then speeds up. So what I did is we kept traffic was kind of really slowing down. So I wanted to see, I wanted to see how good it was. And, and, and so I kind of hovered over the brake just in case. And that thing slowed all the way down to like one mile an hour. I thought, wow, this is crazy. Now, we live in a pretty soft age compared to other people. So you, you know what? You're going to have to exercise. You're going to have to do something to offset it. But like our one preacher said, don't make sure you're balanced. Don't go overboard with it. But you should. You got to have some bodily exercise. Uh, you need some spirit exercise. How do you get that? Through your Bible reading and prayer. Last of all, Dr. Ruckman gave this. He said, uh, exercise the soul through art, music, and literature. And talking about being well-balanced. Well-balanced. And if there was ever a well-balanced man, that fellow was. How are you using your body for the Lord? How are you using it? How are you using it? Uh, by the way, the Lord will take care of the needs of your body. Because it says at the end of verse 13, and the Lord for the body. The Lord will take care of you. He'll take care of you. All right, now I'd like to say this in chapter 10. Chapter 10, you know this one. But God is faithful in temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And I guess the, uh, the, the reason why the Holy Spirit put that in there is because many times when you go through something, you begin to think, I'm the only one who has ever gone through this, right? <laughs> uh, but that's not true. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have gone through what you've gone through and, uh, and are going through it at this present moment, and some of them worse than you go through it. It says, there is no temptation taken you, but such... And I'm not trying to, like, uh, dampen what you're going through. I'm not trying to say that. I'm trying to encourage you that there's other people who've been through it, and the Lord got them through it, so He can get you through it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay? That there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God! <laughs> but God is faithful. Now, we can park there for a while. Because I'm glad God's faithful. There's a lot of people, and even me myself, where I've said something and haven't come through on it. I haven't always been there. You haven't always been there. But there's one person who's always there. And that's the Lord. But God is faithful. God is faithful. You ever had somebody tell you, I'll be there? And they never show? I never show. All right, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, uh, now I, I think I got this right here. All right. I've, I've heard a lot of people say this. They say this. They'll say, uh, they'll say God will never put any uh, more on you than you can bear. And before you say anything, he'll say, God will never put more on you than you can bear. However, uh, how many have ever read Abraham getting ready to offer his son up on an altar? That's pretty tough. Or Paul despairing of even life itself. Or Job cursing the day in which he was born. But he said, he know what the way I take. And, uh, and uh, I'll tell you this, though. Here it is. You've got, you've got uh, the, 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 uh, the, the key to the verse is found at the end there. The Lord will give you the ability to bear it. How? By the way of escape. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You and your natural ability and with your natural skills and your, your influence and your sphere of, of friends... You cannot bear this stuff on your own. But when the temptation comes along, a way of escape comes right along with it. The Lord will put on you, and I believe that. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right on this. If I'm wrong, come let me know. But I think the Lord will put more on you than you can bear, but never more than you and He can bear. Because the, isn't the key to the verse about the way of escape? That's the key. You know what the problem is? You don't take the way of escape. That's the problem. The Lord's given it to you every single time because he said he was faithful. We learned something when we were up there. We learned that sometimes when your pressure comes on and you're saying, God, take, say, take this away. And he begins to put the pressure on even harder because mercy says no. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Sometimes the Lord's trying to make something of you. And the only way to do it is to put the pressure on. And he's got to do it. But I'll tell you what, there's a way of escape. That doesn't mean you're not going to get out of it. Didn't say that you could get out of it. It says that you may be able to bear it. 
That's what it is. I'm not telling you all of a sudden all your problems are done in life. <laughs> you ever notice it seems like people are preaching that Christianity nowadays is the answer to all your problems. As soon as you get saved, no problems. <laughs> Did I get the wrong salvation? <laughs> I trow not. <laughs> No, I got the right one. <laughs> There's problems as a Christian. <laughs> Car's going to break down. Yeah. Yeah. Wash machine's going to break down. You're going to get sick. Yeah. Lose your job. Money problems. Marriage problems. Yeah. Family problems. I mean, these are going to happen. Yeah. But the Lord's with you the whole step of the way. Yeah. All right, let's wind this up. So notice in uh, chapter 12. Chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 24. The next thing is God tempers the body, but God tempers the body. He says, for our comely parts have no need, but God, uh, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care uh, one for another. So the Lord tempers the body together. All right, I looked it up, the word temper in a dictionary, because I'm a part of that not many wise. So I looked up the dictionary. And to be tempered means duly mixed or modified. Or the tempering process for steel is a process of heating it, uh, which is used to increase the toughness of the iron. So sometimes the Lord will heat you up to make you stronger. You ever notice that verse that says iron sharpeneth iron? That ain't going to happen without friction, though. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, brother. And I thank the Lord for the people that he has put in my life. Come on, preacher. That at the time I was saying, man, why is this happening? Yeah. That's right. But it sharpened me. Yeah. And it made me better. I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go through it again. <laughs> but I'm sure I'll have to. <laughs> Because he tempers the body. I forget exactly what it's called, but in a shipbuilding industry uh, that I used to work in, they, they, they would put two pieces of steel together to, uh, to the, 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 um, the deck of the ship was aluminum. So they have an aluminum base, they have to put steel to kind of help buffer the corrosion when they set a toilet and shower module on top of it. So this block of, of, of metal was put together, and I was told that the way they had to get these two different metals together was by blasting them together in a factory. Obviously, you wouldn't do that on the ship, you know. But they put it in a special thing, and boom! Formed those things together. Could You know what the Lord sometimes does in the, in the body? Yeah, I'm on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> he brings somebody into your life, and you're like, Lord, <laughs> boom! <laughs> and the Lord knows what he's doing, though. He knows what he's doing. And the Lord will bring Christians into your life. And you know what you do? You just pray for them. You love them. And uh, sometimes they may not even be the problem. Sometimes you might be the problem. You know, uh, when I was a kid, I had one of those knife sharpening kits, you know. And I'd take that little stone and, you know, and sharpen the knife. Could you imagine the knife saying, oh, why is this stone doing this to me? The, the stone is the problem. No, the dull knife is the problem. And the stone is trying to help the knife. So sometimes the Lord's got to bring somebody into our life because I'm the problem. And the Lord says, okay, we're going we're to grind that away. We're going to help you out. You know, I'm glad he's the one responsible for the tempering. I'm glad. All right, uh, take your Bible, look at chapter 15, chapter 15. This and one more. All right, chapter 15, verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some men will say, how are the dead raised? And with what body do they come? Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. So you take and you put a seed in the ground... It comes up something else, something different. Then he says in verse 38, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. I want to say, but God gives a resurrected body as he sees fit. 
I'm so glad that one day I'm going to get up to glory. I'm going to have a resurrected body. Yeah. I mean, I'll be able to sing as loud as I want <laughs> and, just, and just sing throughout all. I'm, I'm glad about that. <laughs> I'll be able to sing all sorts of range. And my range only goes so far. I can sing outside of range. I can sing parts that I... You ever try to sing a part? And you think you're singing the part until you hear somebody record it and play it back to you. Like, ooh, what was I doing? <laughs> I'm talking about it's going to be great, man. I mean, you think about it. If I have a body like Jesus Christ, there I'm going to be up there in glory. Walking through walls. Flying through space. <laughs> eating just to eat. <laughs> and the best part about it. The best part about it is because I got a glorified body, I now can see the Savior. I mean, right now, if the Lord opened up heaven, you'd atomize. You'd disappear. You'd be gone. Thank God he doesn't open up heaven and show himself. You'd be gone like that. Well, maybe for us, that'd be a good thing. We'd be up in glory. But one day I'll be able to see him. And then everything that we read about and everything we preached about and everything we, we thought about in our mind's eye. Uh, and you, you ever try to think about what it's going to be like? You try to put yourself there, and, and you're, you're trying to see there you are. You're on the you're on the street of gold. And you're like, wow, look at this thing. Hey, I can see through it. It's like transparent glass. Wow, it's amazing. Ooh, that look at that water. That water coming out. Ooh, that looks, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take a drink out of that thing. Mm, just nothing but pleasure. Ooh, this is good. You walk along and say, Hey, David. How are you doing? Yeah. Hey, Moses. Oh, whoa. What is amazing. You see some of your loved ones have gone on before. Hey, hey Dad. How are you? I say it's going to be great. Hey, are you walking over? You see that tree of life that's right there across that river? Whoa, look at that. That's beautiful, man. How you say, I'm going to follow this stream. You follow that stream on up. It's coming from somewhere. I want to find the headwaters. <laughs> and so you follow that thing up. You follow it up. And all of a sudden, you come out to a sea of glass. Oh, hey. And you hear a lot of noise. A lot of noise. I mean, singing and shouting and holy, 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 Lord, God Almighty. I mean, all we can do is imagine it right now. We get there, and we're standing on, we look up, there's 24 elders there. There's a feast around here. I mean, there's angels, there's people everywhere just praising one individual. And you see him. Man. One day we're going to be there. Yeah. Amen. We're going to see it. Yeah. We're going to smell the air. Oh, we're never going to grow old. Yeah. We're going to have a sinful body. Yeah. I don't have to check my thoughts. Yeah. And I don't have to plead the blood anymore. Yeah. And I don't have to listen to any wickedness. Yeah. And I don't have to go and apologize to somebody because I did wrong. Yeah. It's just going to be all right. So after all these but gods, last of all, but God is where your thanks should be. So verse 57 says, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, as we get ready to go into this next year, let's get God in on it. Let's don't go run out ahead of him. Don't lag behind him. Say, God, I want to be right where you are. And man, brothers and sisters, if next year, if the trumpet sounds... We'll have Jubilee up there. Amen. Amen. I love you. Thanks for letting me preach. Amen.